from lush forests in the south through mountains and glaciers along the ruptured coastline of Norway up to the Arctic islands of Svalbard and the Barents Sea. This is northernmost Europe. Surviving here is for specialists who have cracked the code. But the wild creatures of Scandinavia are shy and difficult to find. Centuries of hunting and fishing have removed all trust in people and it is almost impossible to get up close to them. But after spending months living and filming in the harsh wilderness of northern Scandinavia, two Norwegian filmmakers have managed to capture the hidden lives of these shy creatures in intimate detail. Scandinavia has a long and incredibly varied coastline. Throughout the ages, the people here have had close contact with the sea and with the animals linked to the sea and coastline. To earn a living, they have fished and hunted whatever the sea and coasts could provide. This has made it very difficult to get close to the wild animals that live here today. Nonetheless, the secret lives of the eagle owl and the white-tailed eagle will be portrayed. The southern coasts of Scandinavia contain many sandy beaches. Here, a little monster is hiding in the sand. It spends most of its time making small cone-shaped traps, also right where people walk or sit. It has been digging traps long before humans thought of the idea. It is the ant lion's larva. It is small and deadly to ants. The ant lion larva is hidden in the bottom of the trap. The sides of the trap are excavated at such an angle that just the weight of an ant will cause the sand to slide. Even with six legs, an ant can't crawl up again. The strike comes quickly from below. One can hardly see it with the naked eye. But at a thousand frames a second, the attack is revealed. The antlion larva bombards the ant with sand grains, making the walls slide beneath it, and the ant tumbles to the bottom of the trap where strong jaws await. It is a battle of life and death which the ant always loses. It is dragged into the monster's lair. In 
contrast to the south, the northern coasts of Scandinavia have an extraordinary landscape. Thousands of islands and huge cliffs that rise up out of the sea. The people here still have strong bonds with nature. On some of the outer islands in the North Atlantic, old houses can still be found, but nobody lives here permanently anymore. Only a few bird tenders come here during the summer. Here, in early spring, they are getting nests ready for eiders, sea ducks, which will soon arrive. But they do so not only for the sake of the eiders. The bird tenders are interested in the eider down, which the eider females pluck from themselves when they hatch their eggs. It is an arrangement which benefits both humans and birds. The eiders are coming in from the sea, where they've been all winter. It's mating season for these large sea ducks. The white males do what they can in order to impress the brown females. It seems like the males flirt with all the females. But most of them have already paired up during the winter. Some have even stayed together for several years. But there's always someone to be kept away from the chosen mate. She lies flat a sure signal to the male. Mating is no great act of love, and it is over quickly. Many eiders make use of the time before egg laying to gain weight. At the bottom of the sea, there are plenty of mussels, clams, snails and crustaceans which the On the northern tip of the Scandinavian peninsula is the North Cape. It's a rugged coast, but it is full of life in the bright summer months. At this bird cliff, large flocks of different bird species breed. The sea just below is particularly rich in food. Spring starts almost empty of birds. But then something happens. Huge numbers of puffins gather. They are the most numerous bird species here, and they congregate in huge flocks. Day by day, the urge to establish themselves on the cliff grows stronger. Swarms of puffins fly constantly looking for a place to occupy on the cliffs. In their hundreds of thousands, they swirl ever closer to the steep slopes. The first land, and more follow. but above them soars a constant peril. The 
The white-tailed eagle can cause widespread panic, but only momentarily. Puffins have to get down to the rocks and get ready to breed. Many of the birds will use the same nest hole as last year. Only the ones breeding for the first time will have to fight for the vacant spots. A partner must also be found. For most of them it's simple. They have a mate from the previous year. Puffins live long, up to 30 years, and the divorce rate is very low. There are also other residents in this metropolis by the sea. Everywhere there is courtship and nesting. The cormorant is in its full breeding plumage. All kinds of postures are used to impress, entice and seduce. The pairs help each other build the nest. The northern gannets are new arrivals in the community. It was not until the 1980s that they began to breed on this high and exposed rock. Now, this big bird has a colony of several thousand. Gannetville. Courting and nesting is also in full swing here. When a couple meets up, they greet each other profusely. New building materials are constantly arriving for Gannetville. Much of the material is natural, but human leftovers are dominant. Fishing nets and net fragments are popular items which the gannets find floating on the sea. In the colony, these bright, indestructible materials dominate. Do the gannets strive to have the most beautiful nest? Or does the debris just look like seaweed when floating out at sea? Nobody knows. But these nesting materials can be fatal. This bird was eventually freed by the cameraman. In Gannetville, it is a love-hate relationship with the neighbors. They all want to breed here, where the conditions are favorable but there is an almost constant battle with the neighbors. These large birds with daggers for beaks will quickly panic if a white-tailed sea eagle gets too close. In a few seconds, the entire rock empties. But the eagle does not attack the gannets. Perhaps it's just testing them to see if there's any weak or sick individuals. Here, up north, the summer nights are bright, but the Idas still feel safe at this time of day. They head towards the shore at night time. Their priority is to check out the nesting sites. The couples do it together, but there's no doubt who's in charge. The bird tenders have a self-imposed ban on going out at night, so the Ida ducks are not scared away. The possible nesting places are thoroughly investigated.
This nest seems popular. And it's quickly occupied. The female lets the other females know. Out on the water, the males are squabbling. But then, the enemy appears. No luck this time for the white-tailed eagle. More visitors arrive in the area from the south. A huge flock of barnacle geese are on their spring migration. They are not easily overlooked or overheard. They have flown non-stop all the way from Scotland. Their first stopover is here, at the Ida's breeding grounds. They still have a long way to go to their own breeding grounds, which are located much further north, right up in Svalbard. They are only stopping to feed here before they move on. The barnacle goose was once an endangered species in Scandinavia. It was protected in the mid-1950s and the stock has now recovered. In some farmers' opinions, the stocks are now too big. Geese and eider ducks enjoy a peaceful coexistence. There is plenty of food here. The female eiders have started to lay eggs. Now she has laid three eggs, and after a couple more, it is time for the 25-day incubation. The barnacle geese have refueled and are continuing their journey north. right up to the Barents Sea, beyond the North Cape to the Arctic archipelago, Svalbard. It seems barren here, filled with icy fjords, icebergs and mountains. Not a single tree can be found. One would not think that much lives up here. But here are the barnacle geese. They already have large goslings. But these youngsters have enemies. Up here, there are none of the usual birds of prey, but the glaucous gull fills their role. It keeps a constant eye on the flock of geese, looking for a weak point.
or tries to provoke one. The geese do not come to the youngster's aid, now at least. They will have peace from the seagull for a while. Svalbard is also a land of contrasts. The distance is short from the barren and deserted to the green and lush. The short-legged and somewhat plump Svalbard reindeer can survive on very little. It is a hardy specialist which lives off the meagre plants that grow here. In the rich seas surrounding Svalbard, there are other specialists. Big specialists. A giant whale appears. The mottled back and small dorsal fin are unmistakable. It's a blue whale, the largest animal on the planet. It can grow up to 33 meters long and weigh up to 200 tons. Blue whales are normally rare visitors to Svalbard, but in recent years, they have been observed more frequently, possibly because there is less ice on the sea in summer. They feed almost exclusively on krill, small crustaceans which are plentiful in these cold waters. The nutrient-rich seas also benefit the birds. Svalbard has large bird cliffs. There are hundreds of thousands of birds on this mountain, but almost only one species, Brunix guillemot. There are many arguments in the bird colony. But there is also room for intimacy and affection. All the pairs have young chicks in front of them or under them. They are hidden from the glaucous skulls who are always ready to snatch a chick. The guillemots dive for small crustaceans and fish. Normally they dive between 20 and 60 meters down, but they can reach depths of over 100 meters. There is a constant array of seafood being brought back to the bird cliff. Soon the chicks themselves will have to venture out to sea and catch their own food. Long before the chicks can actually fly, it happens. The first bold jump. Father escorts the chick down towards the sea. Here, where the sea meets the cliff, it is quite safe to jump. The chick will certainly land in the water. At this bird cliff, things are different. There's a large area of land in front of the cliff. The chick will be in real peril if its jump ends here and not in the sea. Both the glaucous gull and the arctic fox revel in the windfall.
there are so many jumping that most of the chicks will survive. Only a few years ago, there was much more ice around Svalbard, even in summer. Back then, the cameramen met polar bears in their true environment, on the drift ice. They could walk from ice floe to ice floe and had easy access to their favorite food items, seals, and not least, seal blubber. Climate change has made its mark on the Arctic. This summer, there's absolutely no drift ice around the islands. Polar bears normally catch seals at their breathing holes in the ice. Therefore, they must either follow the ice further and further away from the islands, or go ashore and see if there's something edible. This impressive skeleton of a fin whale looks like it has been plucked clean. But one polar bear knows that there is still food to be found here. A young polar bear is keeping a watch out for what is going on. It's probably hungry. Wisely, it withdraws without a fight. But what can the polar bears hunt when the ice is gone? is the largest pinniped on Svalbard. The stock has recovered well after the conservation efforts introduced in the 1950s. Many of the old resting places are now in use again. There's a constant traffic of animals moving to and from the resting places on the beach. The largest walrus weighs about 1,500 kilos and the big, blubbery bodies do not move gracefully when on land. But in the sea, it is an entirely different matter. The water is their element. Walruses are gregarious animals. They prefer to lie as close together as possible. There is always much pushing, shoving and prodding before everyone is in place. It's best to lie in the center, especially for the young animals. On the outside are the largest males. They don't even fear their only land-based enemy, the polar bear. It can show up anywhere and at any time. The polar bear has little chance of killing adult walruses. With the calves, it's different. They do not have the protection of thick skin and formidable tusks. The females herd the young in between them for protection. The polar bear looks to see if some of the animals are sick or weak. But then, pa 
panic in the crowd. A second bear shows up. In the water, the walruses feel safe. This time, there'll be no meal for the polar bears. Climate change is not estimated to have such a negative impact on walruses as on polar bears. With still less sea ice around the Svalbard Islands, the polar bear may disappear as a regular breeding species on Svalbard within the next 20 years. At North Cape, the grey and rugged cliffs are almost unrecognisable. The islands receive tons of guano from the birds. Common scurvy grass lies like a blanket over much of the cliff. It is rich in vitamin C and has saved many a sailor from scurvy in the past. In some places, it's almost like hanging gardens, several stories tall. Everywhere with a little soil contains a lush coastal flora thanks to the birds. There's a new arrival in the burrow of the Atlantic Puffin. Puffins only lay a single egg, and both parents take turns keeping the chick warm while the other is out fishing. Their food consists mainly of sand eels. Both parents feed the chick up to five times a day when there's enough food. In this burrow, a parent is alone with the chick. No one's coming home with a beak full of fish for the chick. Something appears to be wrong. Many birds arrive with filled beaks, but they all move on to other burrows. If they're not a couple, they don't stand a chance of successfully raising a chick. On the rocks below the burrow lies a dead puffin. Is it the other parent? However, there are many who would like to help clean up. On the large rock outside the single parent's burrow, a puffin displays an unusual hunting technique. It tries to steal the catch of the others. Is it the single parent trying to get food? Or just an alternative way of getting food? And thus, the inevitable has happened. The chick lies dead outside the burrow. And it is not the only one. Meanwhile, the female eider duck has been incubating her clutch of eggs for almost a month. Her body is trembling and she appears uneasy. She's also talking to the ducklings inside the eggs, 
so that they will be able to recognize her voice. The nest is lined with lovely eiderdown. The female has simply plucked them out of her breast to keep the eggs warm during the hatching. And then, the big moment. The duckling's first meeting with the outside world. Over the next days, the chirping call of ducklings can be heard from many nests. The daycare aunts have also heard the calls. They are females who do not have chicks themselves. They have a strong desire to help take care of their little new eiders. Although it doesn't seem to suit the mother right now. Further along the coast, another large bird has its nest. It's the Eurasian eagle owl. The male, which sits a little further away, is equally well camouflaged. She has just one small chick in the nest. Although nest might be too grand a description, as eagle owls do not build actual nests. They often make do with just a depression in the ground. The male scouts for food, but it seems that prey is scarce this year. Here in the north, Scandinavia's largest owl prefers water voles, which it glides stealthily up to and snatches in its talons. The feathers on the edge of the wings have a border of fine fringes, which makes it almost silent when it flies. When the female has waited a long time for the male to come back with prey, she fetches a water vol from her cache. She also keeps an eye out for the white-tailed eagle which can take the eagle owls. Some distance away, there is another owl nest. A bright shuttlecock of a young owl looks very attentively around to see whether his mother or father are back with food. They need to return soon, as one of the youngsters doesn't look too well. This water vole won't change the youngster's luck. The stronger sibling will have the best chances. The smaller of the two is simply dying. Big brother senses this and tests whether little brother has become food. The eider ducklings are a day old, and the comfortable nest must be vacated. The ducklings are to follow their mother down to the water. It's a short but dangerous trip. The gulls could easily snatch a duckling. Daycare aunts make themselves useful and work to protect the ducklings.
now that the Ida family have left the nest, they will not return. Which means that the Ida down can be collected. After sorting by hand, the down becomes stuffing for expensive Ida down duvets and pillows. Out on the water, the Idas form a large flock of mothers, aunts and young. It increases safety. Nevertheless, there are still seagulls trying to get a treat. tailed eagle turns up and this gains the attention of the seagulls. They also have young that need protecting. After a few days, most of the Ida mothers only have a couple of ducklings left anyway. On the bird cliff, the gannets still reside on their very own cliff. They have long since laid their eggs, and there are also young of different ages. The adults take turns guarding the chick. Eagles and seagulls are always on the prowl. A small, unattended chick would be very easy prey. Right here, there are plenty of fish in the sea. The gannets and cormorants bring home a continuous stream of fish for their young. All fish caught are swallowed whole and carried back stored in the stomach, well protected against thieves. But when the runway is crowded, landing is not easy for the gannets. When regurgitated by the parents, the somewhat pickled fish are eaten by the chicks. That way, nothing is wasted. The cormorants have a more unrestrained way of handling the feeding of their chicks. Hordes of birds are eating from the abundant seas around the bird cliffs. It is this bounty of the sea which provides the basis for a plentiful wildlife of birds and animals here on the coast. The herring once again have solid stocks after being nearly destroyed. During the autumn, they move toward the coast and draw large mammals with them. Humperback whales. They are as long as a bus and can weigh up to 30 to 40 tons. young eagles. The female must be out hunting. White-tailed eagles are monogamous and will stay in the same nest year after year. In Iceland, 
the same eagle family has used a nest continuously for 150 years. She has no food with her this time. Maybe it was just to check that everything is in order in the nest. Even a mighty eagle must tolerate occasional taunting. Totally disrespectful, a great black-backed gull dives towards the eagle, because the gull has its own nest in the vicinity. Later, she returns with a common eagle dish, a fish. The sharp beak has become a delicate pair of tweezers. By late September, only the gannets are still left on the bird cliff here at the North Cape. Their young are now as large as their parents. Some couples have lost their offspring and are engaged in a late flirt. Others are missing mates who never escaped from the tempting but dangerous nesting materials. Both ravens and white-tailed eagles have benefited from the wealth of the bird cliffs. Now the white-tailed eagle doesn't have many other places left to find food. Someone should be very worried about just that. But there's really no choice. They have to take a chance and jump, with or without style. Those two landed well. The eagle does not dare venture into this gorge. There are other, more obvious candidates. Youngsters on open water. Youngsters tumbling helplessly in the scurvy grass. the eagle does not attack any of them. It prefers going after smaller prey. Maybe the dagger beaks of these birds are a deterrent. The eagle has found a juvenile which is already dead. No need to struggle when you can get the food served. One by one, the juvenile gannets make it out to sea. From here on, they must fend for themselves. Hard and challenging, but also rich and generous. In this northernmost part of Europe, where the continuing cycle of life follows the demanding change of the seasons.